And I would like to hand over to our speaker today, who is Dan Puplet, who will be talking to us all about wildlife tracking. So Dan, over to you. Great, thanks, Beck. Um, uh, afternoon, everyone. So thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. And I'm really excited to be talking about a topic that um, is very close to my heart. I've um, been interested in natural history and in nature since I was really young and um, interested in all different aspects of natural history, but one in particular is wildlife tracking. And I also have a, a part of my background in conservation and as well as environmental education and really find that tracking can be such a useful tool for um, wildlife conservation. So, and hopefully during the course of this presentation, you'll see some of the applications that we can apply um, wildlife tracking to in and to benefit wildlife around us. So just a bit of a overview, actually before, before we uh, start, I'll just, in case anyone's curious about these um, tracks just here, um the, you'll see there's a, a kind of a, a series of tracks either side from the, the measurements the uh the scale just beside it you'll see they're pretty small with this tail drag mark here and this is a great example of um some of my favorite kind of substrate when you get into tracking you start to get into looking at um the kind of qualities of different kinds of mud and substrate and this is this is some top class mud and these are actually new tracks along here so really really tiny in this very fine silt and then here we've actually on the top left and um, kind of facing downwards is the a front foot of a red squirrel. So kind of two for the price of one in this um, picture. A bit of an overview of what we're going to be looking at. So just a, a broad look at wildlife tracking as this kind of incredibly old human skill that still has relevance today. Some of the key categories of track and sign that we can actually look out for. And then um, examples of some some of the tracks and signs of particular species that are of conservation concern or some of the ways that we can actually apply it um, in, in conservation and in biological recording. And then a, a few tips on taking it further if you're interested in getting more into track and sign. So just to give a kind of taking a step back, really, if we look um, at kind of the, the span of human existence on this planet for a good chunk of it we've been or well, since the very early days of humans um modern humans being around homo sapiens we've been um tracking and probably pre um homo sapiens species you know our, our ancestors as well um also been using tracking basically to find food for a good chunk of that time but it's a basically a skill that i think we're really hardwired for and so while i'm you know, the majority of people now involved in tracking aren't necessarily using it to find food. My my personal key interest in it is for conservation and particularly environmental education. When I do a lot of um, natural history, field skills, education with people of all different ages and tracking is a great way to get into that. So we can use it for um, various aspects of biological recording and even in kind of detection or prevention of wildlife crime as some applications, you know, um, um, if we get our eye in for certain signs, like the fact that there's a badger set in a particular area, and then if we see that it's disturbed or damaged, um, that can be something we could report to a, a local wildlife crime officer. We'd only know how to do that by recognizing those actual signs. Um, just as a couple of examples. Um, and then it involves some really um, specific skills and quite a wide range of skills as well including kind of pattern recognition being able to develop search images humans are generally really good at that and using deduction there's a kind of fun csi element to tracking which a lot of people really enjoy it gets us to actually understand more about animal physiology you know the structure of an animal animal's foot or the way it moves when you start to read the particular gates of an animal um, and also it really helps us to understand more broadly about natural history when I often often say when we start, you know, when we look at a track, um, if we ask enough questions very quickly, we're going to have to understand more about the plants in a given area or sometimes even the geology or um, looking at weather patterns and all of these things really tie in. So it's a very um, useful gateway to understanding natural history more broadly. Um, so doing courses like the 
um, a lot of the courses through the FSC, which cover lots of different aspects of natural history, they'll help you become a better tracker and vice versa. Becoming a good tracker helps you become a general um, good naturalist. Learning these skills also helps us with observer reliability. And when it comes to biological recording, that's obviously essential. We need to be really certain about what we're recording. And there's certain um, features, for example, when we look at particular footprints that um, when we learn the fine details, we can much more accurately and confidently identify, say, a, um, an otter track as an otter track rather than something else. Now we'll look briefly at some of the main categories of track and sign because um, often we think with tracking, we often think of footprints, but clear footprints aren't, especially in Britain at least, um, a lot of the time we, we're not finding clear footprints. Certain substrates we will, but like sand or mud to snow, but there's plenty we won't. But footprints are really useful for um, identifying species and some sometimes the way they're moving, behavior, things like that. So here we've got some nice wood mouse tracks actually along a beach or in a cave on a beach. Feeding signs come in all sorts, all different shapes and sizes. These are a variety of feeding signs from a, several different mammals and birds on a range of different um, seeds um, and cones and nuts. Droppings, um, they can be really useful getting a handle on species and if you want to get a bit forensic about it and you're careful about it then looking at um, content as well and that can tell us a huge amount so this was these um, kilogram bags here were actually bear scat in um, Slovakia and these were analyzed to, to see what the bears have been eating but the same applies to badgers and all sorts closer to home various homes and resting places so things like this beaver lodge here, this is in the, in the highlands of Scotland. Um, and other kind of discarded body parts, as well as going back to the feeding sites, you know, that could also be kill sites, for example, it could be a bird of prey that's killed something. So there may be bits and pieces lying around, but we may just find discarded feathers and bones and hairs. Getting to recognize these can be really helpful for our, developing our field skills. Various eggs and cases, so we may find the remains of a bird egg that's been eaten by something or in this, um, I was going to say in this case, excuse the pun, but in this um, instance, the um, this is the case egg case of a common spotted cat shark. So it could come in all different shapes and sizes. And loads of other signs as well, things like rubs, deer rubs and wallows, trails, um, even sound like um, interpreting behavior and particular vocalizations of birds actually ties into tracking in a huge way, helps us to see uh, more wildlife and understand way more about what's going on. So um, just this first one, so we're going to look at a series, a few different animals, and this is definitely by not even close to exhaustive. This is just a small sample of some of the wildlife that we can um, help via using tracking skills. And also I'll just be showing a very kind of a, a small selection of some of the signs these animals leave behind. There's plenty I've had to leave out, but just a, a taster. So, um, just, to, just to start off, if you felt like in the chat, just maybe typing in who you think this is, what species have we got here? This may be, I imagine, familiar to a lot of people, maybe not to others. So just curious if you wanted to um, type in. And while we're looking at it, this is a really good example of how um, so I can see a couple of comments already. So, um, yeah, a good example. So if we didn't know what this was, you can tell something about an animal's physiology often by its feet, the structure of its feet. So in this case, we can see these long claws and they're going to have to be there for a particular reason. Um, could be several reasons in this case for digging. Um, and this is, yeah, you're quite right. This is a, a badger, as you said, badger. Um, but just an example of how um, tracking also gets us to understand more about animal physiology as well. So yeah, badger prints have these um, kidney, broad kidney-shaped palm pad here. Like other mustelids, members of the weasel family, they have five toes on each foot, but um, some often times the thumb toe, the thumb right here, doesn't show very clearly, and they have a broad kind of blocky appearance. Other nice bits of badger sign. This is a very well-worn trail. So badgers are real creatures of habit. 
and this trail um, goes through a field and I see it summer and winter and often this grows up with deep barley or other crops and the, the badgers are still working their way through but they're a very particular kind of trail about 20 centimeters wide very flat to the ground um, other things you might find like with badgers looking at bar where a trail goes under a barbed wire fence and you can see the um these white tipped black and white hairs and badger sets as well they're relatively easy to identify too so a badger sets as its collection of burrows is known but the individual holes will be a, a fair size and when we're looking at the holes of different size um, burrows there can be um we can categorize them in different ways and um, size wise if it's something that you could like, stick your head in not that i'd definitely recommend not sticking your head in but if you can imagine that you could the chances are that it's either a badger or a fox um, in some cases rabbit warren rabbit burrows will kind of collapse in a way that they get bigger but usually it's a a badger or a fox and badger tends to be wider than it is tall they often have a kind of d profile a bit like the letter d on its side and usually a lot of spoil outside you might see bits of bedding and also you may find hairs in and amongst the, the sand and then other other signs of badger evidence of badger that um you can come across these are quite common to find in lawns in areas where there are badgers and they're known as snuffle holes so badgers eat and um, they're really omnivorous but their diet is often 60 percent or more earthworms so if they find a nice bit of pasture or a nice lawn they'll often dig these um snuffle holes and you'll feel if you feel inside the hole you can feel the kind of conical shape of the badger's nose and sometimes you might even see the hole where the earthworm is sucked out but they usually have a little pile of um, spoil here and then it's quite common to find the odd badger footprint in there can be confused with rabbit scrapes rabbits will do a, a kind of a scrape but rabbits will usually leave their droppings on there um, as a more of a scent marking behavior other bits of badger sign so here we have um, uh, badger looking. so badgers tend to be pretty tidy and fastidious animals and they'll most of the time they'll dig this shallow pit leave their droppings in it and they'll often do that at the edge of the territory the territorial boundary so with just um, on that so that's a few id tips for some of the some badger signs there's others as well um, but badgers obviously are a very uh, important species in conservation terms and so just getting our eye in over time we can develop these search images for these particular signs and that can help us to say if we wanted to send in a biological record or just to keep an eye on the you know the vicinity of the step without you know disturbing it but keep an eye just in case perhaps there's a you know a development happens or someone disturbs it in some way then we can really help safeguard these animals another um, five toed foot um one of the features of the the mustelids the weasel family so this is a pretty big one and this is right by a river this is um this is an otter fairly common in otter tracks to find see webbing in there you can't really see it so clearly in this one but they have these teardrop shaped toes and um yeah again the thumb doesn't always show very clearly can be confused with some other um some other prints but if you generally these the muscle lids when you don't see the thumb showing the rest of the foot is really asymmetrical if we were looking at a dog or something like that, the, the track would be much more symmetrical. So I don't have time to go into a huge amount of detail on the ID, but just a few examples of like how we can reliably and um, tell certain tracks from others. And in a lot of, for example, the, the, this front bit of what's known as the palm or the metacarpal pad um, impresses really deeply into the ground. And in other, other muster is for comparison, much smaller. Here we have the American mink and it tends to be very star-like appearance and again a species of real relevance in terms of conservation and sadly because of the, the damage they they do to um, some of our native wildlife and here just showing a bit more detail this is a, a otter that was sadly killed by a car and um, but just to i find it really useful kind of seen grizzly but i often take pictures of animal feet because it can help me understand the, the morphology of their feet better and that helps me see 
um, more clearly or see more subtle detail when I'm actually looking at tracks in the ground. And then another classic otter sign is otter spraint. So for some reason, otters get their own name for their scat. And um, I don't know of any other animal that was. And I looked up the origins from it. It comes from old French and originally Latin, and it means to squeeze out. So um, that will be a, if you ever get asked that in a pub quiz, you'll know where sprints came from. But these ones, this one on the left, you can see lots of fish bone in there. And uh, the one on the right was actually really, really fresh, even got a bubble. Um, and um, but they tend to do these on very prominent features along the watercourse, often a rock. This is a kind of fallen fence post and very typically under bridges as well. This is on along the, this is actually at um, Malum Tarn. Um, uh, so one of the, the FSC centers um, along the edge of the town, there's this, see this bit of um, kind of very bright green grass here. That's actually been nutrient enriched by otters depositing their sprints on there repeatedly. So here, this is another one where um, there's otter sprint just underneath the bridge. And you can see again, the nutrient enrichment, it's made this kind of um, greenish patch of algae there, which can actually be spotted from a distance. Oh, I can see, I'm seeing here that there's a, an issue with my connections. Sorry about that. I'm, it's not too bad, Dan. It just every so often you just get a bit of laggy voice, a bit of robot voice, but it's not too bad. Um, oh, okay. It catches up on itself. It might uh, be worth that's actually any... just the way I usually speak. Sorry, sorry yeah. about If you've got any um, background apps running, it might be worth just shutting them off. But apart from that, I can't think of anything else you might be able to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought I'd done that. I'm just going to check that quickly just no to make it. Uh... But yeah, we, we can still hear you. So it is the, it's just the occasional lag. So yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just going to see if I can. If you just bear with me, I'll see if I can shut down anything that's not needed. Okay. This may help. We'll see. Fingers crossed. I'm sure it'll be fine. So here's another bit of otter sign. So otters. Um, Dens are known as halts, and this is under the roots of an ash tree. And another thing as well with, with tracking is that it can really help us. Once we get our eye in for a field sign, it can really help us to predict um, or to, to choose good places for camera trapping. And camera trapping itself is just such, as I'm sure some of you know or have tried it out, you know, it's such a useful tool for sussing out what animals are in an area. And but obviously there's, we often have big areas of countryside or urban areas or wherever, and it's good to have a starting point of where to focus, where to put our camera trap. So um, reading track and sign can really help us to position them well. Other species that we may be, may be of interest, things like squirrels, red and gray. Um, unfortunately, the field signs aren't, you can't reliably tell them apart between red and gray squirrels. So if you only have one or the other in an area, then you're fine. But if there's both, um, you, you need to do other stuff like things like hair traps, which again is another tracking technique. But here we've got a, you see this hole here, the hazelnut shaped hole and just to the left, these halves of the shell. And that's a typical way that squirrels deal with hazelnuts is um, they'll actually split them clean in half. And funny enough, squirrels, the, the lower mandible isn't actually properly fused. It has ligament there so they can separate the lower incisors and pop the nut open, which um, I always think is a great, uh, would be a great party trick to be able to do. And very classic uh, red squirrel feeding signs or, or squirrel feeding signs. These were from red squirrels. Again, can't really tell them apart from greys, but at least you'd know you have squirrels in the area by seeing these tufty top um, cones with a fairly rough appearance. 
occasionally you play the angle of the bite. This is like tracking trivia, but the angle of the bite here, you can actually tell if it's a left or right handed squirrel. So the one on the left is actually a left hander, the one on the right is a right hander. But, but um, we won't have to, time to go into that in too much detail, but it um, just shows some of the, the stuff that you can work out with tracking can get, can be kind of quite interesting in its own way. Footprints of a squirrel, not um, something, well, actually in, in areas of woodland um, with muddy puddles and things like that, you can actually come across them quite frequently. It depends where you are. So some areas, if there's the substrate, um, you can see them. They have four toes in the front and five on the back, like a lot of other rodents. Squirrel feeding station. These are Norway spruce cones, and they like to, um, red squirrels in particular, really like Norway spruce and Scots pine and, and others. And um, they'll often eat them on a feeding station. And here's the set of four toes, so the, the hind feet. This row of set of three just here in a row is a really typical sign or feature of a lot of rodents. This is on a hind foot, the three central toes, the three in a row. If you see that, you know you've probably got a rodent. Smaller ones like mice and voles, harder to tell apart, but it is possible as well. And here's a squirrel dray up in a tree. So they tend to be quite kind of football shaped um, and football sized, maybe 40 centimeters ish across kind of a sphere of twigs often right up against the trunk. When we get our eye in, we can learn to rec tell them apart. There's other things that will be of interest, things like a sparrowhawk nests or rook nests, and um, which can look similar, but so there's techniques we can use to start telling these apart. Um, again, when it comes to surveying for squirrels and say which, whichever species, but particularly in areas where there are red squirrels, really important to know the, the signs that we can look out for. And as we all know, with biological recording generally, or with, with conservation, Generally, you know, so much conservation relies on good biological records and quite a lot of that is through citizen science. So through, for those of you who are involved in FSCs, BioLinks or other similar projects, absolutely vital. And the only reason we really know that certain species are increasing or decreasing or, or whatever is that people have taken the time to, to log and record them um, over the decades. And um, so, yeah, so tracking can play a part in that. Just aware of time, so I'm going to skip over a few of these, but these are some water vole signs. This is a water vole run in some long grass. And this hole going into a, a ditch and typical water vole droppings. Um, their behavior is actually slightly different in the highlands to the lowlands, but there's some similarities in the droppings are the same, pretty much whatever these kind of tic-tac-like greenish blunt ended droppings. Just curious if um, how the connection is doing just now. Yeah, it's uh, better than it was. It's still a little bit choppy, but it's absolutely fine, Dan. Um, okay. And we can hear exactly what you're saying, so no worries. Okay, thanks. thanks. So other other feed. This is water bowl sign feeding signs. They often, um, um, yeah, snip bits of vegetation, rushes, and other vegetation. Um, maybe about four or five centimeters long with a very distinct 45 degree angle at them. And you'll often find them um, in, in water vole areas. This was actually right by Malamtan as well, or um, near the Malamtan center. And other um, species of conservation interest and very excitingly, as I'm no doubt you're all aware, beavers are really making a comeback in various parts of, of the UK and um, it's great to see bits of sign like this was such an important um, keystone species, you know, that has such beneficial impact on so much other wildlife. This is to me a really uplifting sight to see beaver sign. And these are sticks that have been chewed by beavers and bits of um, uh, chips from a tree that has been cutting down. Um, and there's a lot of people, particularly professional ecologists, who do, sometimes I do ecological surveys um, where we're do, looking for things like some ecologists specialize in bats or other kind of protected species. So looking for bat sign and um, bat droppings look very similar to mouse droppings. 
like oftentimes they'll be stuck kind of again like snagged on a wall this is actually on a outside kind of um, window ledge that's um usually often in old houses and often below a cavity just in the edge of the roof and whereas mouse droppings tend to be quite hard or squishy this one here on the right you can see it's actually just turned to dust so they're basically full of a lot of insects chitin the exoskeleton and they just turn to powder. Again, if you know you've got bats around, that's really important to, to prevent them being disturbed. Other um, other signs, these can be less less easy to get to species level, but here we've got a kill site. And I really find it interesting, you know, doing the CSI thing of trying to interpret what's going on at a kill site. Here we've got wood pigeon feathers. That's one of the thing, reasons it's good to really, I like to collect different feathers and try and ID them, because the more we do that, the more we can then interpret what's gone on at a kill site. So this is a wood pigeon, there's a tail feather with this kind of pale gray band that's been eaten by something. We can see that the quill is right near the front of the screen, the front of the image have been um, sheared off. So that's a very typical sign of a mammalian predator of a carnivore. And well, they'll bite through the feathers, whereas birds of prey tend to pluck them out. Sometimes foxes will, or not uncommonly, will rip them out as well in big chunks. That's when you see them sheared like this, you know a mammal has dealt with it. Not necessarily killed it, could have scavenged it. But, um, and there's ways from this we can sometimes get um, more detail. For example, these are just snipped almost individually. And from where it was, this is more likely a pine martin than a fox. A fox will often take a good chunk off at once, like a load of feathers together. So um, even though we couldn't say 100% it was pine martin, that could be the kind of situation where we could then um, put a camera trap just to, to back it up. And, and the reason for that, why I think this could be pine martin is because I know they're in the area, but pine martin have a lot shorter jaw than a fox. So they're less capable of taking off a whole load of wing feathers at once. They're just going to snip a few at a time. Could have been something else like a stoat, but um, that's my hunch. And this kind of mass of feathers here on a rock right by the coast, this is actually a peregrine kill site. And with them, um, uh, raptor kills, as I was saying, that tends to be the tips of the feathers are usually intact. Here, the, where the bill, the raptor's bill has pulled it out, it's creased the feather here. Um, again, we might not always be able to get that to species level, but if even if we suspect, say it's a peregrine, we can maybe then keep an eye out and um, get some good records. And here, this is a, a breastbone of a bird, and it's really common when a raptor, a bird of prey has killed another bird and has eat, eaten it, they often go for the head first and the breast meat. And when they're eating the, the breast meat, it's quite common that they take out big chunks here. So this is probably a peregrine actually did this, but even see it on sparrowhawk kills on tiny songbirds. So if you see that breastbone, look for damage in it. That's a good sign it's a raptor kill. Um, these kind of streaks of serpent prey will often fire the droppings out the back. Um, in, a, in a line and unlike owls which will usually drop them down that can help you find an owl roost. Pellets are always a great fun thing to explore. Um, imagine some of you have um, pulled apart owl pellets and these aren't owl pellets these are something bigger but pellets for those who aren't familiar um, a lot of carnivorous birds um, if not all will um, produce these pellets so things like gulls, crows, raptors, owls, herons and when they eat, um, when they eat something full of, say, fur or bone or whatever, it's actually more efficient for them to regurgitate the solid part. With an owl, we can pull them apart and find bits of skull and stuff in there, which is great fun. And, um, and that's usually possible because the owl's digestive juices are quite, uh, not a strong series of raptors. So, um, um, you tend to find the bones, whereas in something like a buzzard pellet, you wouldn't. These are, um, I was very lucky to find these golden eagle pellets on top of a, a mountain in the highlands. And you can see they're absolutely huge. But you can even start to rec identify hair in them as well. This is deer hair in the one on the left. And, and with bones and things as well, I find, I find it really just interesting in its own right, collecting animal bones, but also um, if I'm you know, looking at kill sites where I find a dead bird or whatever, these are the, actually the pelvises of a series of different birds, including a, a pink-footed goose and a, a wood pigeon at the bottom and several others. 
and also rec as I was saying, recognizing feathers, um, particularly when I do a bit of raptor surveying as well. And a rat, the one on the bottom here is actually a, these are both tail feathers. The bottom one is actually a female sparrowhawk, which is the bigger of the two, as in other birds of prey. And this one at the top is a male goshawk, and it just gives, which is the smaller of the, um, the goshawks. And so it gives a sense of the size of a goshawk, but with around a rat, around a sparrowhawk kind of nesting area, um, if you see you know, one of these discarded feathers, it's a, an indication that um, it's actively being used. And, um, and there's ways you can even tell if the same female, if you found that exact same tail feather from the same part of the tail the following year, when she's grown a new one and molted it again, the patterns would be exactly the same. So you'd know you had the same female there. So that's great in terms of raptor monitoring. And other projects have been fortunate to be involved in. This is a, um, a very typical circular track of a, a, a feline, in this case, actually a lynx. So cat tracks tend to be circular with this kind of C-shaped negative space. Again, there's lots of technical detail we can go into, but I don't have time to do that, but just in terms of the overall impression of them, um, and this is part of a, there's a project um, I was fortunate to go over to Slovakia and they still still running this project where you get to go tracking in the snow, looking for signs of wolves and lynx and other wildlife and um, and um, then recording it. And that really helps with their, their conservation. And this was me looking quite happy, collecting a sample of lynx urine from the snow here. So it was quite a, one of the highlights of the trip. And also been fortunate to be involved in other, of a range of different rewilding and conservation projects over the years. And um, this is a project that some of you may have come, may have come across, a fantastic project, Bunloit, it's in the Highlands, not far from Inverness. And, um, and they're doing all sorts of um, incredible work to boost biodiversity and to capture carbon and to benefit the local community and economy. And they've got students involved in doing some of the baseline surveys. So. I was helping to establish some mammal transects where we walked in total about as close to 14 kilometers of transects, recording tracks and signs of different mammals. And that is one of the parts of the baseline kind of biodiversity survey that they're doing. So in the subsequent years, we'll be able to monitor changes. But again, it's just an example of how we can use tracks and signs to, to help um, conservation efforts. Other things like this, this is typical deer feeding sign. Um, with the, with the ungulates, um, the, um, so hoofed mammals like deer and, um, sheep, they only have bottom incisors. So the, the top incisors, are, they don't have top incisors. They just have this kind of rubbery palate. And so that shows when they're biting vegetation, it, it has this kind of ragged appearance like this. And that's relevant because we can use this in, when we're doing say herbivore impact assessments looking at the impact of deer browsing, we can actually tell whether deer are browsing something or whether it's rabbits or hares, which they do much cleaner bites and things. But again, there's um, various applications there. And then just the last few things before we, before we get onto questions and um, think about a few other things, which may not seem obviously like tracking, but um, they are, they actually absolutely are signs that animals leave behind. And there's a, a guy who's a phenomenal tracker um, in uh, the States called Casey McFarland, and a great guy. And he's, he often says the art of tracking, it's one, um, it's the art of uh, being able to read life anywhere. There's no tracker who can understand, like recognize every track, but the principle of it is that we, we're getting that familiar with the wildlife around us that we're trying as much as possible to interpret what's going on. And, um, and there's whole other elements of that as well, obviously just purely in terms of nature connection, which all generally we recognize more and more being so valuable for our mental health, our physical health, and also for, I think the, you know, the future of, um, life on this planet in some ways depends, um, on how much we're able to connect with and appreciate the natural world. So anyway, a bit of a tangent, but the point being is that here we've got signs of life. So some of you may recognize these, um, these are called nopper galls and galls are basically these abnormal growths that form on all sorts of plants and they're caused by all sorts of things. Sometimes um, nematode worms or viruses or fungi or 
mites. And in this case, there's various, a whole load of different wasps that create galls on oak. And so these ones, the Nopagall wasp lays, the tiny, tiny wasp, they lay their eggs in the um, acorn bud and the acorn subsequently as it grows, it's really deformed and there's a grub growing inside there. But again, that's a biological record. We could, even without seeing the wasp or the grub, that's effectively a sign it's left behind that can help us. And we send in those records, then we've got some sense of the distribution of these particular animals. Other kinds of galls, I find these fantastic, a mixture of what are known as spangle galls. The flatter ones are common spangle galls. And then there's these um, what other ones, which are known as silk button galls. And other, other signs from, I mean, when it comes to invertebrate signs, it's absolutely tons. So this is the, the tiniest of tiny kind of tasters, but just to give a sense. So here we've got this aspen leaf. And this is, we see this, um, if you keep an eye out on aspen leaves, this time of year when they're starting to um, go their autumn colours, but you may see a patch of green remaining. And this is caused by a micro moth called the Aspen Green Island Leaf Miner. And basically you can see the hole here. So the, the um, lava um, was in there possibly emerged from here, but its presence in there has actually blocked the chlorophyll from retreating back into the tree. So you see these patches here. And again, without even seeing the moth, you can get an ID and the record from that. And similarly with this, this is something, keep an eye out on bramble leaves. You may see, you may have seen these plenty of times already, um, but this is another micro moth, um, the, sometimes known as the bramble leaf miner. And um, you see, it's got these fantastic patterns. I really, really like finding these. And you'll see there's several of them in here, but you notice how they go from absolutely tiny, really thin, and they get fatter and fatter, basically as the caterpillar moves through the leaf feeding um, getting fatter and fatter as it goes and eventually it will um, pupate and emerge. So um, just a few, um, a few examples there of, of some of the, the signs that we can look for. Just a quick mention of this as well, it may be of interest to some of you, but there's a, an evaluation system um, which I've been involved in for quite a long time now, which I find really useful um, called Cyber Tracker. And, Seems like a weird name, but the, the cyber bit actually came from when it started in South Africa. They were using kind of handheld software, a bit like iSpot or any of the other biological recording kind of apps. And, but they were using the skills of indigenous people there to help with biological recording. And this system was developed to te test their reliability in the field to see, you know, how good their skills actually were. And this system has basically gone to America and now to the UK and the rest of Europe and and it's the track and sign aspect of it. It's a two day evaluation where you're assessed on your skills in the field and um, on all, all kind of different imaginable tracks and signs and you get a score at the end of it. And it's um, a really great way. Some people go into it purely as a learning experience and because you get told afterwards what all the signs are. So you learn as you go along. If you get them wrong, it kind of doesn't matter so much or you can kind of test where your, your skills are at. Um, so yeah, that's just something to mention. And, and, um, and there's also trailing evaluations, which is where you're learning to actually follow animals and observe them. Um, but this is my friend here, John Ryder, who's a fantastic tracker. And he's one of the, the th only three evaluators in Europe so far. Um, and so he hosts um, these evaluations um, in various parts of the UK and elsewhere. So I just thought I'd mention that in case it's of interest. Um, and a few key points just to sum up so tracking has so many different applications um, as i mentioned like various applications in conservation biological recording citizen science which all you know in a sense are all under the same umbrella of, of um, wildlife conservation and just as generally anyone i think interested in natural history um, will benefit by getting to understand some tracks and signs. I think it can help us, as I was saying before, understand so much more about all different aspects of the natural world and how they all fit together. It really improves our observer reliability and overall just gives us a much better, I find for myself, the more I'm out tracking and looking at um, signs of things, um, it gets me asking questions, it gets me curious about um, what these animals are up to, trying to predict, you know, like I, I'll often come away um, with more questions than I have answers, if that makes sense, you know, I might then, for example, seeing that as a random example, that bramble leaf miner, then think, okay, like what, what animals actually prey on those 
um, caterpillars, is there anything that particularly targets them when they're in leaf? I don't know. Maybe someone else does, but this, this um, kind of endless questions we can generate and that can really help us actually. Um, we quite likely that if we inquire enough, we'll make some new discoveries that will really help um, everyone else as well to understand wildlife better and to help wildlife itself. A few resources that I saw someone kindly mentioned. Thank you. The my um, fold out charts. Um, that's thanks for the plug. And there's also, as mentioned, there's a, a mammals one and the other FSC charts. I find them for a long time. I'm sure some of you have as well. I find them addictively collectible because they're just so useful and so nice to have around. So um, I've got the the um, yeah also you know there's caterpillars and all sorts of stuff. Um, I have a seaweed one on my wall in my bathroom and. Um, so yeah, they're good resources generally for natural history, for taking stuff in the field. And um, I thought I'd give you for my own one. Also, my, my friend John, who I mentioned, he's written this recent book, Track and Sign, really good guide with some very up-to-date stuff on field signs. There's a ton of other tracking books as well. Um, Nick Baker's Nature Tracker's Handbook is really good. Loads of others that I, I, I collect tracking books obsessively. And, um, um, but so I've just picked a, a small handful here, but there's others as well. So finally, just wanted to say a, a thank you, really thank you to uh, FSC for the, the invitation to do this talk and for everyone for attending. And just a few, if, if you're interested in um, and on social media, if you, there's a few um, pages on Instagram and Facebook, including my own one here, lots of others where you can get involved in tracking FSC by Lynx Mammal Society and others too, it's not a space to list them all, but some of the key ones, there's so many um, kind of opportunities for citizen science out there. But um, yeah, plenty of ways that you can you can get involved. So, and also just to mention that if anyone's interested in going into more depth in, in track and sign training, I run my own courses and I also do courses through um, FSC. I do some of the on, online deco skills courses and place-based as well, as well as other tracking courses. So do keep an eye out if you're interested. So anyway, after that plug, I'd be really um, interested just to hear anyone, if anyone does have any questions, if not, no worries. But if you do, I'd be um, really happy to chat. I, I love talking about trackings. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dan, for that whistle-stop tour through tracks and size. It is obviously such a broad and big topic. So to cram it into 45 minutes is very impressive. Um, and as Dan said, yes, so Dan does a lot with the FSC already. Um, so do keep an eye out um, for his upcoming 2022 courses because they are in works, which is amazing news. Um, so we've got a question here from Sam, who would like to know what your favourite ever track or sign is that you've encountered. It's a good question. Oh, great. Thanks for that, Sam. So um, I might have to cheat a bit because someone asked me this the other day and I thought of three and um, one of them is that when a, that new track, the new tracks at the start, I just really like there's something aesthetically about them. I just thought, oh, that's and very rare. I think it's the only new tracks I've seen for sure, fate, like in the flesh. Another one was um, when in Slovakia, when we, we've been following this, some wolves for quite a long time through the snow and, um, and then just coming down this slope. So it's like snowshoeing along, coming down this slope, we could see the tracks of the lynx and the lynx started to walk in the wolves' footsteps. And that, to me, that was just so cool. I nearly exploded. I just almost couldn't handle it. So um, like, that was exciting. And then the final one, I'll, um, it's just near, um, just near where I live. So on the Murray coast, a lot of sandstone. And amazingly, there's these ancient reptile tracks, older than dinosaurs. They're about 250 million years old, things like Dicynodonts and others. And their tracks are still visible in the sandstone there. And it blows my mind. I go there again and again. And I was there recently with an, a local amateur paleontologist who was telling me more about them. And it was just phenomenal. And he also pointed out, and this, this one was kind of off the chart for me, is he pointed out tiny tracks of something called Paleohelcura, which is a, a ancient kind of scorpion. And their tracks were just faintly visible in the sandstone 250 million years later. So that was, they're, they're my three kind of favorite ones. That's so cool. It's like basically going back in history. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so Caroline has asked, how could we book onto tracking courses you do? So what we can do for you, Caroline, is um, in our follow-up email that we send about this, we will um, send links to Dan's website where I'm assuming you can book courses with yourself, Dan. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Perfect. And then obviously there's the FSC courses as well. So 
Um, if you do sign up to the newsletter, they'll all be announced in there as well. So a couple of options for you there. Um, if does anyone else have any other questions, you can put your hand up and unmute yourself, put your camera on and come and ask in person if you'd like. Just got another one from Sarah. And um, so she says, any advice for camera placement for a complete novice? Great. Oh, thanks, Sarah. That's a good. Yeah, really good question. Um, so when putting up a camera trap, um, some of the things I find really useful is to find in the landscape anything that's a kind of natural funnel. And so what I mean by that is anything that's going to um, kind of push several animals just into a um, one kind of narrow area, if that makes sense. So say, for example, if you've got a woodland path where there's a, a steep slope on one side and a bit of a slope going down on the other side, then the chances are the animals are just going to stay on that kind of narrow bit or even kind of on the entrance or exit to a bridge, depending on how, you know, obviously the security of your camera as well, you don't want it to get nicked, but places like that where, and then also keeping an eye out for general, if you get your eye in for trails in the woods, you know, so deer will make trails, um, badgers and others, and often they'll be kind of multi-species trails, but it's a regularly well-used route that can help. And then I find it helpful to put the camera not at kind of not perpendicular. So if that's if we're looking from above, if that's the trail there, don't put it perpendicular. And um, you're often just likely to catch just the rear end of the deer or whatever. If you put it at slight a 45 degree angle, it gives more time for the camera to pick pick the animal up. Um, so that can be helpful. And then depending on the species, so say you're wanting to, you think, oh maybe there's badgers here. Then obviously just think about the height and even take a few trial shots to then just check exactly what it's taking a picture of. And other things, just make sure there's no like wavy grass and things like that in front of it. Tend to avoid pointing it into the sun because that doesn't help things. Often you get a lot of glare. Um, so those are a, a few of the a few of the um, tips that I give. But and just experimenting, Sarah, definitely. Um, I find just trial and error. Just keep on trying stuff out and try and be creative with it is really good fun. So um, things like often with practice, you can say, okay, I really would like to get a, a squirrel picture or a badger or whatever. So just by doing it again and again, and probably getting, well, I've got hundreds, thousands probably of pictures that had barely anything on it or a bit of wavy grass or whatever, but with practice, you just get more and more kind of accurate and rewarding pictures. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear how you, how you get on with that. That's a great tip. Um, great, so we have a comment from Natasha who really wants to get into plastering, uh, plaster casting tracks that they find outside so do you have any tips for the best methods for making the molds from plaster of paris to avoid the plaster of paris leaking into the environment supposedly causing a risk to nature right thanks natasha so yeah what i usually do is it's good to have a frame of some kind to hold the plaster in to stop it leaking out and i have a kit just a ready-made kit that's easy for me to grab so say for some i'm walking nearby and i see what others is made to mud. I want to get in a hurry, so I just grab this bag and in it, I have the usual stuff like I've got water and the plaster and stuff like that. But in terms of stopping it leaking, I like to use just kind of old plant pots, you know, old plastic pot, plant pots. So you could use an old plastic bottle or anything like that. So it's cut into a cylinder. So you just have a, a plastic cylinder like this. And um, and that way you can, and I have them of different sizes too. Um, so a range of like really small ones to big ones if I want to, Get a big animal track or several but then just by pushing that cylinder into the ground and pouring the plaster in it stops it leaking leaking out if the ground's a bit hard you might find it hard to push in properly and you may if you keep an eye you may see a bit of kind of plaster leaking out and you can do like an emergency damming it up with some surrounding mud something like that so but that's the best way to do it you can use even cardboard as well can work but i found find those ones are really um old just plastic that would be recycled anyway you know it's just um yeah really useful and they're quite durable and you can use them again and again yeah great tip so making use of something that probably all already have in our houses to to do it with great tip um perfect so does anyone else have anything else they would like to ask dan about tracking in general um obviously we've had some on camera traps and taking moles so anything at all that you think now is your time to ask the expert um if you do have anything else i oh, just just saw angela's comment angela saying use dental or medical grade plaster that's a good point you can get different kinds of plaster and they all work but 
those ones are often you get a kind of more robust cast. So yeah, good, good point, Angela. Yeah, Thank great you. tip. <laughs> Thanks for that, Angela.